Honorable well, Speaker, everything that we do must be critically examined and the purpose for which it is done. The address of the President to the National Assembly is not a mere formality. Anybody who views it, views it from that point of view, you are wrong. It is not a mere formality. And it is fundamentally important because it is a yardstick that he provides for us to measure. Not only the National Assembly, but the very people that they are supposed to be serving. They need that yardstick to measure what they are providing against what is being done. That is the fundamental purpose of the nation. That is why it is mandatory at least once the president must address the nation through the National Assembly. At least once. And it is necessary because that yardstick is needed by every citizen to measure what is being planned against what is being done. What is being provided in terms of finances, in terms of funding, against what is really it is yielding, what it is, it is really yielding. That is the fundamental purpose of the, the state of the nation's address, as we call it. So this little booklet, the address, is a sieve that you use to examine what is really happening concretely in this country. And that's why he has gone from every sector to the other sector. Because every sector is consuming the taxpayer's money. The taxpayer needs to know what I am providing for this particular sector. Is it really yielding what I need? And we, members of the National Assembly, this helps to facilitate the operations of our oversight functions. We need this data to be able to do what is required of us by the people we represent. So it cannot just be a mere formality. And it cannot just be a mere reporting. Madam Speaker, to begin with, paragraph 5, page 10, I think it is a mistake, a type of mistake, because they said 5 million, but in brackets, 500 million, which is the correct figure. Page 10 of the address, paragraph 5. Madam Speaker, what is today the most crucial thing confronting this nation? And what is threatening the whole world is COVID-19. I was looking forward to a comprehensive report on this the current stage where we are. Because we know a lot of things have been done and we must clap, we must applaud the Ministry of Health and their frontline workers for the courage and determination that they have been confronting this terrible thing that is threatening the whole world. That in spite of our meager resources, we started with determination and courage, with the little we have and confronted the sort of this terrible thing. And we can pound our chest and say, we have tried. Because COVID is now almost going to seven months old in the world. And in the Gambia, we are still talking about less than 200 people have died.
in spite of the meager resources and equipment that we have to confront this deadly disease. I think the Ministry of Health must, of necessity, provide this National Assembly a comprehensive report on this particular situation. What are the challenges? What have we accomplished? And what do we still need to do? Because uh, in the speech I'm told that uh, the eight treatment centers are being constructed. But we are about six months, seven months old. I thought this would have been the first thing that we should have considered. Because we can't do without that. But all the same, it is never too late for reason to prevail. I know a lot of things have been done and there are a lot of difficulties to be confronted. And we still need resources to help this sector to be able to become powerful, strong, in terms of personnel, in terms of equipment, in terms of everything that they require to confront this deadly disease. Honorable Speaker, I will not be able to do exactly what I would never, what I normally do, because of reasons that are specific to myself. But I'll take few sectors. And I'm happy that the president in, on the, under this particular sector began with the issue itself, land, regional government. I raised here some time ago, and on and that day, happily, almost all the ministers were here, including the vice president, who was Mr. Dabo at the time. Land conflict is a big issue in this country. And almost every constituency, there is a problem, land problem. And we cannot just sit by and look at this, because this is conflict between people, communities who are living together. In my constituency, there are situations where they have been there for almost two, three years, or more than that, almost going to 10 years. And these issues are not addressed. And this is affecting people who are living together, relatives. But it has jeopardized all that relationship. Friends have become enemies. Relatives have become enemies to each other because of that issue. And that is why government must, we must, you must address this issue in a comprehensive and conclusive way so that we can move ahead with development. That development can take place in rural areas as far as these situations are prevailing, and they are numerous. In my area, there is nowhere where there isn't one. I can't name not one, but many in my constituency. And I know how they are in other constituencies, so in the URA. But we are silent. As far as I'm concerned, no serious effort is being made to address the issues. And there is a need to do that. Otherwise, you are giving big problem to those who are supposed to live in harmony. Agriculture. But I think I've seen in the speech, so many investments have been made with a view to creating employment facilities, with a view to creating employment facilities for the youth here and there, good. But if we want to address that issue in a conclusive way, we can't.
cannot but address the issue of agriculture. This is the only area we can un address the issue of unemployment, the issue of poverty eradication, the issue of revenue generation, the issue of becoming economically independent. This is the only area we can, which means that we must invest into this. If I go to fisheries, which is part of agriculture, you will see that even though, even though the sums that are given there Sorry. Yes. We are told in the first paragraph of that speech in that area that 178 million 710,608 dollars is were generated by this sector. But we know, they have said it here, these are fishing licenses, fines, and fish lines. Supposing we empower this particular sector with the ability to invest, provide these investors, and then we, we do the fishing ourselves. How many of our young people are going to work on those ships, vessels? How much fish or how much sea resources are they going to provide? How many people are going to work on the land where these things are going to be, to, to be deposited? How many? How much, how much revenue are we going to generate? We can do without taking money from anywhere in the world. I say this, we can do our development without necessarily indebting ourselves to a point that we cannot move forward. 55 years we have been here, we have been totally, development has been totally because of what we are doing. Take and pay. When you take, you must pay before you can do anything else. And what you use, used to pay is what you need to do your development. The interest on it is even enough to bring about your development. 55 years, we have diamond. Diamond is, this is, there is no diamond more than this. And we can even expand it because we can cultivate it. So, I think there is a need for us education. I think worldwide, this COVID-19, the sector it has affected so terribly, and the sector without which the world cannot move is the education sector. For almost seven months, six schools are closed. And they are still being closed. I think there is a need for schools to reopen. But we must prepare for it. I think there is a need for all the principals of high school to create a think tank and see and plan what the reopening of schools will be. Upper basic principals should do likewise. Lower basic schools principals should do likewise. We must plan, but we cannot continue to close the schools because that means we are fettering development of knowledge, development of instruments required for the development of our country. COVID-19 is here with us. 
We have learned to put up with malaria. We have learned to put up with high blood pressure. We have learned to put up with all types of diseases. We must make COVID-19 part of that. You must plan and prepare yourself to put up with it. But it should not deter and fetter our survival. Human beings have the capacity to overcome any difficulty. We have the capacity to overcome any difficulty if we use what we have. But this must be well planned. I see that it is there, they, are being, they are preparing. But given the nature, the overcrowded nature of our schools, from primary to high school, this needs real thinking, real planning. Begin, even if you say double shift, there is already double shift in every single school. There is double shift in every single high school and almost in every upper, upper, upper basic school. So that means that critically, we are faced with a very complex situation, which needs real thinking, real plan. It is not just double shift, because double shift is already there. It's not just extending the number of hours. No, it's not increasing the number of days. It's not enough. Those also have their negative impacts. I was a teacher, many of you were teachers. You teach from 8 o'clock up to 2 o'clock. A serious teacher. And they want you to continue from 2 o'clock to 6 o'clock. <laughs> Your output is going to be affected. And the children you are teaching also are going to be affected. So that's why I'm saying, the situation in which we are, we need think tanks. The principals must constitute that, to plan this more realistically, and in a more productive way. But we cannot just jump and say open schools. <laughs> there will be a tragedy of monumental proportions. Transport works and infrastructure. For me, the saddest thing in this country is that there is no public transport. Because the public transport there is, is inadequate, ineffective. You stand on this road in the morning, you feel sad. People stand on their legs, sometimes from morning up to afternoon looking for transport to come. Once upon a time, that was not a big problem in this country. When we had a, what they call it, the transport company that was there before, GPTC. Now, how many transports were applying in this road? Panjul Serakunda, Brickham, all those places. They were here. Basse alone, over 10 buses were going to Basse. Almost every big village in Basse has a bus going there. That was possible some years ago. We are moving forward and we are going backward. What is that type of development? This is supposed to be an industry which was generating money. The money being generated should be plowed back into production. But now it's dead, almost dead. One step forward, ten step back. And we say we are developing. Super possible. When are we going to help our people to stop, stop crying on the roads for want of transport? Go there now, you'll find them packed at Westfield. This is not correct. 55 years of independence, they say. For me, it's less than that. But for them, 55 years of independence, we still have problem with transport moving from one place to the other in this country. It should be addressed. Our people are tired. 
And it's not even helpful for this COVID-19. Because you see, the, the congestion that you, you, you made rules against could not be respected. Because people must go. When transport comes, everybody goes in. Who are you going to drive out? Madam Speaker, I think this is, this is a fundamental issue that must be given serious thought and uh, solved once more. <laughs> Information. Every citizen has a right to information, they say. Now, so the Gambia is about how many years old? Since 1960. That's about 40 years. And still, it is inaccessible in some areas in my part of the country. And we are all citizens of this republic. We are all paying access. Some have access to certain things to which others don't have. And we say we are equal before the law. Because we are all taxpayers. I think by now, at this radio, anywhere you go in the Gambia, you just to the Gambia, clear as this light. Should be like that. The technology in the world today does not permit that. That people are there, there, when you open it, there is so much noise, you cannot hear anything. You have to go through something, you know, there are, you know, technical tactics. That's, 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 that's not enough for that. And the same goes, that's why our people say radio, radio combo, or television combo. Because <laughs> the ones here are the ones who have access, adequate access to it. To, to sum up, I want to, Madam, to sum up, I want to I want to cite and read if you allow me what is in the speech itself because when you read them you feel inspired. And we need to be inspired in order to be able to move forward. So I'm going to read this ones here. He said, COVID-19 he's speaking about. It has brought about a new social order. That is page 66, paragraph 4. It has brought about a new social order that calls for... I think you were asking for permission to read it. Yes. <laughs> For what, what page? page? Page 66. Paragraph 4. It has brought about a new social order that calls for discipline, collective action, determination, and accepting reality as it is. And then, page 67, continuing the paragraph 6, these are moments to build on resilience in order to achieve our noble aspirations. But finally, the one on page 68, paragraph 11, We have to have a new way of embracing solidarity for our collective safety and survival. Let us redefine our roles 
and development pact against the realities of the times. For me, I find this very inspiring because this is what we need in our circumstances. All, all the time we need it, but we need them more in the current circumstances. This is what we require. Without it, we can do anything. There is no force, however impregnable, that a united and determined people cannot overcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker.